attention, I'd like to welcome you to the uh, for this, this month's program with Lana Garden Talks. Uh, for tonight, we have, uh, or this evening, Alex Ullenhank. Um, and uh, just one thing with him is he's the only certified arborist in the county. So uh, when it comes to trees, he knows his stuff. So. A little bit. <laughs> Not everything. A little bit. Enough to be dangerous. Right? <laughs> so anyway, um, hopefully I have a lot of good questions for him as he goes through this. And, uh, Thanks. Yeah, like you said, uh, certified arborist, know a little, just a fancy way of saying know a little bit about trees. Don't know everything, so I'll do your best to answer your questions. If you got any through the whole thing, feel free to raise your hand. Let me know. Uh, I said, but like I said, I'll do my best. I don't know everything, but trees are my expertise. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. We'll just today's subject more will be focused on more evergreen versus uh, you know shade trees and things like that. So um, I'm sure all you guys know about the benefits of trees, uh, you know, filters the air, the water. Uh, if you got them close to your house, it provides shade. It also provides wind screens for uh, in the winter time, reduces your heating and cooling. Um, you know, basically climate control, it moderates the ground, increases property value. Big trees can add up to, you know, up to $3,000 per tree if you've got a large property with big trees. Um, and then they've proven that it increases social interaction, reduces the crime rate, and so on. And so that's what I found on the website. Arbor Day Foundation has a nice uh, calculator. They, every tree species they have, you enter your tree species or how big it is house and then it'll tell you how much the tree providing every year in a sort of way say like $243 per year provides the annual benefits and you know stage in electricity natural gas filters the air so it's kind of neat how that, if you got a tree you want to see how much it benefits your property <clears throat> um, they also have a tree identification like as it comes to trees, there's always a Latin name, which is the long name that no one understands, which is the true name of any tree. The common name can be called many sorts of different, different types of uh, names. Um, and so like uh, Asia Rubum October Glory is actually a red maple, October Glory. October Glory is a variety name. There's many different varieties of red maples. So um, not to be confused, there's a common name and a Latin name, so you can see both of that. Um, some nice phone, I guess if anybody has apps on their phone, Plant Snap or a Purdue Tree Doctor is a, a way to take a picture of a, a leaf or a, any type of plant. It'll do the best ID to, to plant and uh, you know, give you advice. So it's kind of neat to have that on your phone. So As it comes to selecting evergreens or any type of tree, uh, the right tree in the right place is what it's all about. You know, how big is it going to get uh, underneath power lines next to your house? Uh, long term, you got to think long term how wide it will get. Uh, a lot of times you get a nice small shrub, it, it looks great, but it's going to grow like anything, so you got to keep in mind uh, the size of it down the road. Um, so, most of the trees we're going to talk about today are, are, are good for our zone. Ohio, you know, six, it was five, I think we're slowly warming up to a six. Um, so, we're basically between five and six for zones. So for selecting trees, uh, how high would a tree get? You know, most evergreens, typically talking about trees, can get, uh, like the Melrose spruces, can get up to 40, 50 feet tall, mature size, and the right conditions. Um, you know, that same tree can stay only uh, 15, 20 feet tall because the conditions are bad, it's slowly growing. And so every condition, every tree will grow different heights and different sites, if that makes sense. You know, same thing with the spread. Um, shape or form. Today, more evergreen, so the more you know, cone shape people like the Christmas tree look. Um, but diff different types of evergreens that grow in uh, different shapes too. Uh, of course, they all grow in different rates. Growth rate, I think, is the biggest factor. They see people say like the white pine will grow super fast. Uh, that's why they use them for lumber. But if you put a fast-growing tree in a bad site, it's going to be slow growing. So it, it varies. Um, you got to keep in mind the soil conditions, the sun, uh, fruit. You know, people don't like acorns dropping, or not acorns, but uh, pine cones. Uh, if you don't like the messy pine cone look, you know, 
go toward an evergreen that don't have so much fruit compared to uh, you know some of those spruces that can get all those pine cones that can be falling. Uh, two different types of trees you'll probably see uh, for sale, container versus ball and burlap. I haven't noticed a big difference one or the other for, for, for evergreens. Um, there's advantages to both. Uh, these way more, so you're going to have to use probably some type of equipment to move them. With the ball and burlap, uh, basically they, they dig the tree out of the ground and pull, put it in uh, a wire with burlap. And the disadvantage of that is you're cutting all those roots more stress on the tree at the time of digging and planting and so you have to keep that in mind you don't have to stake it as much you don't have to water it as much so it's because uh, the soil stays wet longer first potting soil and the, and the containers will dry out faster um, so you'd have to water those more not enough not as much weight and so the potting the potted plants will be able to i guess tip over in the wind faster because there's not enough, much of an anchor on the bottom so and cost-wise, too, well, it's, honestly, it's probably about the same, uh, you know, depending on the size of your shrub or tree. Uh, evergreen. Why evergreen? People like them because they provide color year-round. Um, either blue, or green, yellow, you know, there's different types. Uh, every, why do they call them evergreen? Because, you know, they don't, I guess they show winter. They show color year round. They do drop their inner needles. Most spruces or pines, uh, like any like any evergreen, they will drop their inner needles about every three years. It's three to five years, depending on the type. And so uh, they're not a true evergreen. They're always going to be dropping needles on the inside. So it's a natural occurring thing. People like it for privacy screens or wind screens because they're year all, uh, they're there year round, providing that coverage. And uh, of course, people like it for Christmas trees or decorations. Um, we're going to talk about most of the common ones I've seen in the in the market because I could do a whole other class and a whole list of evergreens. So we'll just try to focus on the ones I've seen most commonly used for this area. Uh, spruces is probably the most popular. Uh, probably why I recommend the most. Norway's Colorado Blues, uh, Black Hills Serbian, um, white spruces. Pines, you probably see a white pine, which is a soft needle pine. Uh, it doesn't stick to your hands and things, it doesn't hurt. Uh, Austrian pine, scotch. Arborvitae, you probably all know what those are. The amber green are the tall and slender kind. Pyramidal. Uh, the techie is the more the bigger, faster growing arborvitae. Hemlocks and the firs are also, you've probably seen those around, uh, but not as much. So some typical uh, evergreen trees. This is Norway spruces, uh, probably my most favorite one, uh, not to be biased, but uh, fast growing, they're hardy. Um, as they get aged, they do. Some people like it, some people don't, but their, need, their needles do droop down as the branches get big. Um, they're nice, great Christmas trees when they're young, but with age, you know, you can start to see those needles droop as the branches hang out. Uh, blue spruces, uh, people still favorite one, put landscaping too, just for that deep rich color. Um, there's many different varieties, Fat Albert, Blue Spruce, the Hoopsie Blue Spruce. Uh, Fat Albert's probably the most popular one. Uh, it's supposed to get as wide as tall, so I mean, you have fit 12 feet wide, 20 feet tall. Um, I've seen a lot of people ask for a small blue spruce, like a baby blue and things like that. It's just, they're hard to find, and if you do find them, no tree stays small forever. They will grow. They might be slower growing, but they will still get big in size. I mean, it's tough to find a, a, a dwarf no, uh, blue spruce. Now, yeah. With the blue spruce, how much does soil affect that color? Um, it probably has the pH. is probably the big thing. Um, the, the color, it, I've seen blue spruces turn almost to a greenish tint, and people wonder what that is. It's probably a lot of times with the, with the type of time of the year, you get a full flush of deep blue color in the spring when the new needles come out and then we'll kind of fade to uh, depending on the type to like a, a bluish green but the soil I have to I don't know too much about the soil uh, doing anything to the blue color but I would say they like the more acidic soil um, they like well drained I've seen these things sit in uh, wet soil and they just do terrible uh, these blue spruces like all spruces they want to be on high ground they don't like wet feet, and so 
Uh, I mean, probably the lower pH, 6.5 pH, is probably better for blue spruce. But I don't know too much about the soil type affecting uh, the color, I guess. But, but yeah, I've seen the variations where they will almost turn into like a green and they'll flush out the blue again in the spring. Uh, pines, white pine is that soft needle. Um, they drop a lot of inner needles. I just had a complaint the other, well, not a complaint, but some call it so they don't like their pine tree because of all the mess they leave underneath. Because you see this mulch right here is all the needles from the inside of this tree. They don't even, even have to mulch this tree. And so they do drop a lot of inner needles, but people like them because they're fast growing and they're soft, soft to the touch. Yeah. So Austrian pines, um, these kind of older school pines. Uh, not a big fan of them anymore, but you see them around. Uh, so, kind of really uh, a long needle pine. And they're a good tree, but in age, they just, uh, just don't do well. Arborvitas, do uh, I have a love hate relationship with them? They look great when uh, they look like this. No, nothing eating them, no bagworms. And when uh, uh, this is the wider type arborvita, techie will get a little faster growing, a little wider, a little taller. The emerald green, you probably see a lot of these in people's backyards for like a screen of privacy, you plant them in a row. Looks great if all of them live and one dies, you got a hole and it's a problem. Um, you know, you try to replace it with a bigger one. So they do great. I, they, I mean, I use them in landscapes all the time because, you know, you can plant them up to three feet apart and they kind of grow into each other. Uh, but we'll talk about the bag worms later. But yeah, it's just. Uh, love-hate relationship with them. And then uh, we'll go to some shrubs. Um, I said this is not limited to everything out there, but this is just some popular ones. You probably see anyone knows the boxwood. They've been around forever. Hardy shrubs, hard to kill. Um, I mean, you can trim them. They're slow growing, so uh, it's just you can trim them into a hedge. It's just, they're very uh, a nice evergreen. And then this is kind of a newer one recently, Mr. Bowling Barber Vita, I've been using a lot of these. It's kind of more of a softer look and feel, blue, greenish. Um, it is an Arbor Vita versus box, so it's a totally different plant, but kind of same size and shape. Um, yeah. So, uh, another like more of a yellow evergreen, if you want more of a yellow color. Gold Charm Cypress is a good choice, kind of a, a mop. Kind of a loose looking uh, a cypress. Uh, they've been around forever. They do well. They offset like a, a red shrub there. They're kind of offset red. Red and yellow kind of goes well in the landscaping. Offset each other. A fire chief fire bite, similar to the Mr. Bowling Ball. I call it Mr. Bowling Ball's second cousin. Uh, same type of texture and leaf. It just has a more of a burnt look, yellow. Some people like it, some people don't. In the wintertime, it can almost look all brown, almost look like a dead shrub. And then come spring, they'll get more green. And so um, it's definitely a nice plant to get some different color. And both stay small. This one, I said, this one stays probably within three feet by three feet. You don't have to do much trimming. Um, that's why they call it Mr. Bowling Ball and Mr. Bowling Ball because it's supposed to stay the size of a ball. <laughs> that size <laughs> never does, but that's probably where they got the name. Uh, more of a blue color shrubs. Uh, Glow blue spruce has probably been around forever. You got a shrub form. This is one on standard, basically grafted to a stem or stick uh, of another plant, and uh, you got your lollipop, glow blue spruce, um, and then blue star juniper is another nice blue one. There's different types of junipers that spread on the ground, they get bigger too. Uh, blue star juniper, you really never have to trim it; it grows super slow. Uh, I see some issues with get some brown spots down when it ages, but um, it's just a good option if you're looking for some blue. Uh, uh, more evergreen shrubs, dwarf Norway spruces, similar to like a bird's nest spruce. Uh, these, I've been using a lot of these too. They're pretty hardy, slow growing. Um, and then hollies too. Hollies are a broadleaf evergreen, so they actually have a leaf and get berries. Not a huge fan of hollies. Uh, they're hit or miss. If you get grown, great. If you got acidic soil, if you amend the soil, you got a protected site. Um, so they don't really like our our soil and they don't like our cold climates as much, but I see a lot of them struggling. And so you can use them if you, if you can uh, <coughs> do some TLC, but uh, it's one of those touchy plants. 
with Holly, it's going to have to have two to get the berries. They do make a Holly kid now. Oh, they do. Yeah, Holly boy, Holly girl, Holly kid. So I always get the kids. <laughs> so you have to get both. So yeah, yeah, you did back in the day. You always had to make sure you had a Holly girl and a Holly boy within on the property. Or if your neighbor had one, they even worked, I think. And then if you get these berries, they have to uh, pollinate each other, and so you uh, have to have one of each. But now they bred. They they got the Holly kid. And apparently, you don't need that, and they always get the berries. So yeah. Um, planting, evergreens like any shrubs, you can plant any time of the year, even in the winter, middle of the winter, as long as it's not frozen. The middle of the winter is actually a good time because it's not stressed, they're dormant, um, you don't have to water so much, just like fall going into winter. Uh, dormant season, like I said, late early spring, late fall, you can do it now too, it just takes a lot more water, being so hot and dry. Um, most burlap, ball and burlap trees are dug like in October or November or early spring and so that's when they're coming more available. Um, so that's why you like I said no one digs ball and burlap trees now because of transplant shock. Just too much stress on a tree when it's this hot and dry. This is a good by the best picture I've seen planting a tree. Uh, it's a shade tree which just goes in there for evergreens. Um, you know show the roots you want to see the root flare showing. Keep the mulch back six to eight inches. Uh, cut the top of the ball or container. Like you definitely take the container all the way off. But if you have a ball and burlap, take the top half off or cut the wire, bend the wires down. Um, the bigger the hole, the better. I know that's good in theory. Uh, I mean, if you got um, super hard soil, I know it's hard to do, but get, try to get that hole as big as you can um, if you've got the time to do it. Um, Staking is always a good idea uh, for the first year you remove the stakes after uh, a year or so. Uh, so. It's all about, you know, don't plant a $100 tree in a $10 hole. So it's, you know, bigger the hole better. Other than that, backfill with original soil. I don't like to amend too much uh, soil, but if you amend the soil, I guess, with new soil, the roots won't want to grow out of that soil and just to circle that pot. That could eventually be like a clay pot, but you want to make sure you just use the original soil. And so they encourage the roots to grow past the hole. That makes sense. Um, any questions about this? And that's why it goes with the saying, plant it high, watch it die, plant it low, never grow, plant it right, sleep at night. So <laughs> that's always a good way to say for evergreens, since we're talking about evergreens, I would lead toward toward the plant it high versus do, uh, low. Evergreens don't like the wet soil. Um, even if you want to plant a little high, add some soil around it um, just to hopefully get that water drain away if you do have a low spot. Um, and this is an example of a low planted tree. You know, I, just dug one up the other day. They asked me what's wrong, and I dug down six inches. I couldn't find any roots yet. Um, so you want to see that root flare coming out until you see that. So um, and this one just planted slightly too high. Um, this will probably live, but it's just going to be stressed for the rest of its life. And this is an example of container trees. You might see um, girdling. They circle the pot and they continue to circle uh, for the rest of its life. So you got to kind of cut the sides of the pot, take the pot off, and cut the sides of the roots. Hopefully they get the roots to spread out. And so you have to keep an eye on that if you're doing container trees. And I try not to fertilize the first uh, trees I'm planting. They're already stressed. It's just all about watering. Um, you can fertilize later, like six, eight months later. In the fall time is a good time to fertilize, October. Um, keep an eye on girdling roots. Tree staking. You, it's not always recommended, but if you have a windy site, you might as well put it on. Just remember to take it off within a year or so, just so you don't have the stake and the string girdling the tree. Um, usually, I don't. Usually, I say don't stake a tree unless you have to. But uh, um, most places around here are pretty windy, and you're going to have that issue. So you can put a stake on it for the first year. The key is too for the webbing. I seen too many people use too small wires or strings. Just use a wide webbing or um, you know something that won't grow that tree. 
just have to keep an eye on it, even keep it loose. Uh, you don't need it super tight just so the tree has something to push against. Um, so you don't really need it super tight. Another, another question? Yeah. The, <clears throat> the top picture there with the girdling, will that same thing happen with the uh, volcano mulch or where they pile the mulch too high around the tree? Right, yeah, because the, the roots will actually grow up into the mulch and then they'll continue to circle because I like the mulch because it's nice growing, you know, organic matter is growing. And so they'll grow up and then grow around. Yeah, volcano mulching will cause a lot of growing roots too and then just suffocate that trunk of that tree and eventually just kill the tree. And so, yeah, that's definitely what we're talking about mulching here a little bit, but yeah, don't want to do that. How quickly does the the girdling start when you when they have the volcanic? Um, it could probably happen within the first year or two. Um, the fine roots will grow up first, and of course they'll get increased in size. Um, and once they reach the surface, they'll kind of turn and keep going around. Okay. So yeah, that could happen pretty fast. Can you see that from the ground when it's doing that or not? You kind of have to dig around. I mean, you have to almost expose, yeah, yeah, yeah. get as much mulch and dirt off as possible to see what the roots are doing. Um, you don't want to be cutting roots and things, but if there's a tree root girdling, pushing on the side of that trunk, it is probably the best option to almost just cut it, that root, <coughs> to, you know, break it loose. Watering. So. Um, so underwatering is just as bad as overwatering. I've seen both. Um, just the other day, I was digging up some perennials around a tree, and the water I dug down six inches, and there was water sitting on the bottom of the hole. And she told me she was watering every other day, and so I knew what the problem was right away. The tree was turning yellow, and I was trying to figure out why. And she said she was watering every other day. I'm like, well, okay, that's good. It's been dry. But then I dug down um, at this place in St. Henry. She said, and I dug down, and it was water sitting at the bottom of the hole and a muddy shovel, and I'm like, the tree was just sitting in water for too long. Mm -hmm. And so overwatering can also be a problem to underwatering. So you might think the tree's hurting because it's not getting enough water, like a time like now, hot and dry, water, 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 but keep an eye on your soil, it can also be too much water. So you want to dig down almost six inches or even more next to your tree and see what the soil feels like. So it's always a good thing to do. Trickle water, like any new tree, like a, a large size tree, trickle water real slow for, for you know for about 30 minutes or so, um, once or twice a week. But then again, you know it depends on your soil and things. So you always got to monitor the, the ground. I guess you don't see it down there, but it says first year they sleep, the second year they creep, and the third year they leap. And so that first year the trees don't do much. They just, they're, they're stressed. They're just sit there and they're just trying to get established. The second year the roots continue to creep out. Um, and then that third year after planting, you really should see your tree start taking off. And so a lot of times it is all about patience. Like Dan was saying about mulching, this is mulch volcano. What we don't want to do, pile the mulch up against the trunk. Because this whole trunk right here, is, it's lacking oxygen. It has water, it has moisture against it. It just can create rot. Um, you want a wider base versus a taller one. And you know, I know Wider the better, unless you have to mow, but I know the nice two or three to four foot rings are nice. That's good, but like I said, wider the better. You know, keep it thin, two to three inches, keep it away from the, the trunk. You want to see that root flare right there. So that's kind of what you're looking for. I see yeah, way too many of these, which it's just a common habit. You edge the tree. Edging is another thing too, far on. <laughs> Yeah, you don't want to be edging the tree. I'm not even a fan of edging anymore. You know, the fine roots are on the top three, four inches of the ground. And when you take, take a spade or a machine around that tree, you're cutting all those roots, throwing the dirt on top of the tree roots, and then just adding mulch, and then you're making a volcano. I almost just take a factor, you can just spray an edge, or you can uh, use a weed whacker, or just something just uh, to create a slight edge, but just don't be going more than an inch deep because just cutting roots can cause more problems. And so I'm not a big fan of edging trees anymore, but you know most people want it, but I just kind of go real lightly. Uh, pruning evergreens, um, 
you want to waste out your planting with doing trimming, you always remove any broken or da damaged uh, branches at any time so they don't uh, cause a problem later. Um, dormant season is always a good time to trim. Uh, so like I said earlier, most evergreens lose their inner needles uh, after three years or older. So it's common, I've seen it before, like arborvitaes will lose their inner, inner needles come, uh, come fall time and I'll get a lot of calls, what's going on, just a natural uh, drop, needle drop uh, before the, the spring spring flush of new growth. You know, a couple ways to trim evergreens. Boxes, the hedges are common practice. Uh, if you're doing a hedge or any type of trim, you kind of want to leave the bottom a little wider than the top. That way the bottom gets light and it doesn't die back. And so it's always a good practice to make the bottom wider than the top. Uh, this is kind of just an example of the wrong plant in the wrong place. Um, it's just too big for that planter. I've seen a lot of evergreens cut back like that, and this browning most likely won't come back. And that's one thing about evergreens, you can't cut it back like broadleaf shrubs uh, in the wintertime. They most likely, they don't have enough energy in their dormant buds to fill this back in with green. And so, usually when an evergreen gets too big, it's time to rip it out. There's not much you can do. You can turn it back as hard as you can until you get to the brown, but um, that's one thing about evergreens. It's, once it's too big, it's probably time to replace it. Just one thing about pruning, um, try not to prune in the late summer, early fall, because a lot of times if you prune in the early fall, to flush out with new growth before winter time, and that new growth can be too tender before you get the, the early frost come uh, winter time. And so just be careful trimming in the late fall, um, but if, when it flushes out in the spring, it's always a good time. Um, but uh, just be very careful in, in the fall, as it might leaf out more growth. This comes to pruning like pines. Pines are uh, kind of tricky because they make candles and the candles are uh, their only, uh, all the candles are on the terminal buds I believe and those usually come out in the spring and you want to cut those in half. Um, it kind of touches the trim. Um, cutting them in half as they're coming out, the candles I guess I want to say. As the can candles are coming out you want to cut them in half uh, before they get too big. Um, you can shear them, you can shear the candles uh, as you trim the trees too. Because if you look on this, we can show this is a spruce, blue spruce. The spruces have buds on the sides where all the candles of the pines are on the, on the tips. And so spruces are more fuller because of these buds on the side because they'll go out this way and this way. The pines are all out from the ends. And so it's easier to trim a spruce than a pine. Um, so there's something to keep in mind. Yeah, if, I, if I trim that candle all the way off, that branch is done growing, right? Pretty much, yeah, because all the terminals, it's all in the end. And so that's where pines are. You see pines, older pines, are more of an open habit. They don't have a dense canopy because everything is on the ends and they lose their inner needles. Where uh, spruces have more lateral uh, buds uh, in between and they can do more of a fuller look. Yeah. If you have a blue spruce and you want to prune it because you don't want it to grow, you want it to stay the, the size it is, yeah. you still do it that way? Yeah, I mean, you can do a hand trim. I actually took shears to blue right. spruce too, keep them, I've seen them done. You can shear them to a nice pyramidal shape if you want. Yeah, um, yeah they, got the dark, they got the buds on the inside, and so if you shear the ends off, they'll continue to be uh, grown. I guess out and then or in and then instead of out. And so you can shear them any time from um, you know May to May to June, July. You know to keep them as small as you can. Yeah, the best time to prune spruces would be like when they flesh out their new growth come June. Um, fertilizing. Uh, it's all about the soil test. If you don't know what's wrong, maybe take a soil test. Evergreens tend to like more acidic soil versus alkaline. Um, don't fertilize new plants right away. It's all about the watering. You can do that later on. Uh, you don't want to burn the roots. Um, triple 15, I mean, if you don't have an idea what your soil is, you know, triple 15 or 12 is a good, have a little bit of everything. Um, it's always a good idea.
of fertilizer. Um, fertilizer, always be around the less than more of fertilizer because you don't want to burn uh, any roots or put too much down. But fertilizer is not always necessary because sometimes the soil tests will show that you're perfectly fine. So. <clears throat> A few years ago, we did a soil test, took it in, took the soil in, and then we got back a report. We could not decipher it. Uh, like so you couldn't figure out what it recommended? Yeah, it wasn't any recommendations, and we couldn't, okay, what's our percentage, uh, what are we deficient in? And yeah. It was gobbledygook, and we, we could put, read pretty well, but right. we couldn't decipher it. Yeah, depends who you go through. I mean, sometimes they would recommend certain ways, but. Uh, like I would say it's high or low, um, but yeah, it depends on your, who you got it from or whatnot. But um, you know, I research them online too, where what number means what. Um, a lot of times they have like an M for medium or L for low or G for good. You know, but it depends on your soil test. It just you have to go ahead. Call your local extension. There you go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they'll be glad to interpret to help you out and at no charge. So. Yeah, show it to Danny, he'll tell you what, what you need. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Are those evergreen spikes that they recommend for fertilizing a decent? It's not bad, it's easy. You could, I you know, it's not a bad way to do it. It's easy because you put them in the ground. But, uh, a lot of times when roots come up to it, it's too much concentrated where it can burn the roots. I mean, it'll leach out and it'll slowly it'll fade away, but um, honestly, Evergreen roots are pretty shallow, just spreading them on top of the ground is almost just as good around the canopy. Um, so it's, uh, I know the grass will probably take up some, but uh, you know, the tree still has, uh, still leach down the tree stick. Most of the roots of the tree are on top six inches of the ground, and so it'll take up most of it. But I don't, I'm not against spikes, but it just, it's not the most ideal. I idea. guess we got young ones, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, I mean, it ain't gonna hurt. I guess, um, you maybe even cut them in half or break them up or something and put them in different holes instead of just one hole. Yeah, kind of like I mentioned the drip line. You know, tree roots go out farther than you think, and so you got plenty of area to fertilize. You know, even fertilizing out here will encourage the roots to go out farther and instead of just concentrating everything underneath the tree. Which I know that said, you know, probably got grass out here, but the grass will take up some. It'll probably even green up if you fertilize the grass too, but. Um, the tree is still getting some of the. Where you know there's different ways to do it. You can do the liquid feeding. Uh, this is like drilling a hole, two-inch hole, and throwing it with loamy soil with tree food mixed in. Um, you could do certain holes underneath the tree canopy. Um, that's one good way to get that fertilizer down deeper. Um, yeah, so this is the liquid feed you hook up to a garden hose. Uh, so yeah, there's def definitely different ways. Fertilize, but like I said, soil test is usually recommended first because sometimes you don't need to. You know, could be something else going on. Um, I was wrong. speaking about evergreens. I've seen a lot of this um, to the word of the point. Uh, it's getting so bad. I'm not even almost recommending blue spruces anymore, unless you're going to spray every year. Uh, it's kind of I got right here. It's called needle cast and rising fever needle cast. It's where the needles turn to like a purple brown. You kind of see it starting like this. It happens on the bottom half of the tree first, because what happens is it's a fungus, a, a disease that grows uh, on the needles. They get little pores on, uh, and <clears throat> the needles fall off. They fall on the ground. The spores live on the needles on the ground through the winter time. Comes the spring's rain. The rain splashes the spores up onto the branches, and it reinfects the tree over and over until the fact that the whole tree will be eventually die over the years. Um, I've seen more and more complaints about these uh, without spraying. Um, this is a, just a general generic fungicide. It has the active ingredient uh, chlorithinyl. I got that right. It's a fungicide. You can find this in any hardware store. Um, it's fairly cheap, but if you have a blue spruce, keep an eye out for this needle cast. If you see any sign of it, you want to be spraying right away. And there was a favor to pass that around. So yeah. Thank you. You kind, of, you kind of notice it's kind of a purple-brown. Um, so it's just not a brown dead needle like a yellow-brown, but it's a little purple. And that's a sign of the, the needle cast. Um, 
to blue spruces. Any spruce can get this, but blue spruces have, for some reason, have getting it worse than any others. Um, like right here, I took this picture in Columbus the other week, and all these blue spruces along this whole road, the whole bottom half were all gone because I think Neil cast. Eventually, the trees are eventually going to go, but year after year, it just keeps reinfecting itself. Um, and spraying the needles like June 1st and again like on June 21st after the first flush because it reinfects the new growth. So once it leaves, the needles leaf out, those are the most uh, vulnerable ones that you mm -hmm. want to spray. And so spraying it twice in June is always a good idea. Um, yeah, keep an eye on it. I just see more and more of that. Can you cut the bottom ones off? I've seen that. Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah, I mean, that's one way to help the situation. I mean, um, but a lot of times, a lot of people don't like that look, or uh, it might kind of keep spreading to the top branches, too. But yes, if they do have any spruce that have the bottom branches dead, you can easily trim those off. It's not going to hurt the tree. But they did at the cemetery, they just got the bottom ones off. Yeah, yeah, and that's you know, definitely an option. And you know, said the spores have far the reach to go to the top, and so that's why the bottom gets affected first. Um, so, something to keep an eye out for. This is the biggest reason why I don't do pines. <laughs> uh, pine needle tip light, uh, I've seen more and more of this too. Uh, all stream pines are really bad for it. Uh, it's just a basic disease that affects the tips of the, all of the the terminal buds of the pines. Eventually, this is why I should line up. The tree will look like this eventually. These are all Austrian pines, and uh, with age, they just get really bad. Um, again, it's a fungus, and it can be sprayed. Um, but the trees overall, with age, they just don't fill out as nice as spruces. And, um, I used to put pines out, but now I'm kind of going towards spruces. They go into evergreen. Bagworms, uh, very bad right now at this time of year. Just keep an eye on them. It's almost getting too late to do any spraying. You probably see more bags of this size. This is kind of the new bag size, probably less than a penny. And these are you know, about two inches long. Um, if you don't catch them fast enough, the, tree, the arborvitaires will look like this. Uh, I've seen more and more of that too. That's why arborvitaires are great until they get bagworms. But if you get on them and you can spray them, Best thing to do is pick off the bags. You usually have a light infestation, uh, and you'll see a few bags. Best thing you can do come in the fall, pick them all off as many as you can reach, because the, the insect is living inside the bag over the winter time. So if you pick the bag off, you take the insect away, and it lays its eggs inside the bag, and then the new ones come out in the spring. And so get as many bags off as you can, and then come in June, July, spraying them with any type of insecticide rated for bagworms. It's a good idea. So you don't have to spray until you see them. I say just really, they can be really sneaky. This this thing could have been green in the spring. It, it could be look like this come August in no time. It's just, what it could, time of year should you spray? Because I understand that that silk on the inside of the bag almost makes it repellent. So correct. Long. And once they get to this size, it's almost too late. This size is still okay to spray. So June, like June, late. A couple times actually, you want to do it more than once. Uh, like you want to do early June and do it again late June. Um, and then come July, this time of year, they're probably seeing a lot of these this size already. And once they get inside the bag, the insect side can't get inside. So you want to do them while they're eating and feeding. Yep. Good. That one, that one will die for sure. This one here? Yeah. Yeah, it's probably long gone. It's probably not going to come back. And, yeah, it's just so. I've seen them go so fast, and join, you know, you leave, you leave for two weeks and you come back and it, it could look like this. It's crazy. So, depends how bad, yeah. They love arborvitaes, that's for sure. It's kind of the dog days of summer right now because I've been getting so many calls lately. You know, arborvitaes with bagworms, you got crab apples with apple scab, and then you got uh, Japanese beetles eating everything right now, too. <laughs> so it's <laughs> everything's hot and dry and stressed. It's just that time of year where things just don't look very well. It's, it's uh, you know I have trees that are turning yellow sooner than they should be. 
you know, dropping leaves because they're drought stricken. Um, it's just that time of year, you know, everything looks great in the spring, and then it's come this time with all the bugs. It's, it, it can be frustrating, but if you keep an eye on everything, you, know, you can catch it early. But that's all I have really have. Um, so if you have any questions or anything, I I use that myself on all the all the time, and a lot of times people can take pictures of their plants if they got something wrong. You know, take a lot of quality pictures and send it to me. Uh, you know, I can try to answer your questions if you got something going on, because um, you know, I could try to take a, a visit, and I know I'm just very busy, so I do my best to stop by, but. Uh, you know, if you want something done sooner, you know, taking pictures, I can take my best guess, and then we can keep investigating. But um, yeah, if anybody have any questions, let me know. Yeah, go ahead. Where are you located? And are you open during the day for people to stop by and buy strawberries? I am located uh, three miles west of Coldwater, State Route 19. Um, I'm by appointment only. I'm not around all day, um, so you have to call or text beforehand. Yeah, Saturday mornings are usually around, but. Um, it's best to call, or even the evenings work too, if you want to stop by in the evenings. Usually work catch me better when you're usually out on the job during the day. So, in and out. Right. Do you have a rule of thumb of how high a tree should be uh, as opposed to how far away from a structure it should be? Let's say you know, if it's a 50 foot tree, should it be 50 feet away from the building? It doesn't take a tornado to take a large tree right um that's how depends how risky you want to be i mean i really don't really matter it depends uh if you're really concerned about tree falling on your house you probably should plant you know just like you said over 75 feet away but you know who knows if that tree's going to hit your house or not down the road if it does fall um you know it's not always good to have a tree rubbing up against your house for the purpose of the mold and Touching your house is not good for the house more than the tree, but um, there's really no role, I guess, out there. It just depends how uh, how comfortable you with with large trees around your house. There's plenty of houses with large trees around them. Uh, it's just every tree has a risk. It's just uh, or uh, a risk of a failure, of, of falling. You know, um, it just depends if it's healthy and if you can find that that risk before it does fall. But there's really no rule of thumb, I would say, I guess. Yeah. How, far, how far back can I trim an overgrown um, boxwood? Boxwood, um, as long as you can, until you see brown, I mean, you want you want to leave a little bit green. Okay. You don't want to be seeing any brown, really. I'm more, I don't trim my shrubs as, as probably as uh, heavy as it should. I, I like to see the green. Um, you know, some people can keep a, a taxis, and taxis can get up to seven feet tall if you let them go. But I've seen people see, keep, keep taxes two feet from the ground for 30 years. You know, you got to trim it though four times a year. It's that small. <laughs> so it's possible to keep things small. You just got to do a lot of trimming and trimming. Mine is very overgrown. I just want to know if I can kind of get it back to right. a normal shape or take it out and do something different. Yeah, and you can trim back and just be careful. Once you start hitting some brown, it might not come back. I actually tested it. I had a taxes this high. I cut it in half in the winter time, see if it'll come back and it never did. So it just doesn't have enough energy in the dormant buds like like any broadleaf shrub would to come back. You know. Will the arborizes emerald green do as well on a like a mound of ground or does it need to be planted in a flat? I think mound I mean I've seen more arborizes die from too much water than underwatering, um, sitting in water. So I mean you want to have a nice mound. You don't want to get too crazy tall, but yeah, I mean, above ground is not going to hurt it if you have enough soil around it. So if you've got a low spot or something, um, yeah. And a lot of times people do that to raise the mound just to get more height at the initial time. You know, you can add two, three feet of soil to, instead of buying a taller plant. So yeah, uh, he had asked about the uh, distance away from the house because of the height. What about the root zone? And foundations, uh, sidewalks, right. driveways, that sort of thing. What kind of considerations there? There's always going to be risk with trees next to a house. Uh, depends on the tree. Depends on exposed tile, exposed walls, and things like that. 
some trees are more vicious and rigorous than others, and so um, you know, some well, some houses can go 30, 40 years out of problems with a big tree next to it. It just depends on the tree and your soil. Uh, you know, if you have exposed tiles, you don't, you know, the tree roots can't get in. I've seen silver, ma silver maples, tree roots get into foundation tiles on the bottom of the basement. So there's, there's always risk mm -hmm. of planting trees too close. The bigger ones, the farther away you want to go. The small ornamental landscape trees usually don't have deep roots, so you don't have too much problem with those. But there's no rule of thumb how far. I guess, yeah, any tree close is too close if you're really concerned about it. <laughs> but there's always a chance because tree, you know, tree roots can go three times the width of its canopy, so um, there's always that risk. And that's just hard to say what tree is better than others, but there's, there's always a chance it can cause problems. Yeah? You had a cypress bush. When you say cypress, you think of uh, damp locations, but are, are is it, would that necessarily be that case for like uh, the cypress bush you had there? Do they oh, like the, the golden charm or cypress, maybe? Yeah. Or something? Um, yeah. There, like any evergreen, I know there's the cypress. There is some cypress and hemlocks that do like shaded wet soil or wet conditions. Um, the golden charm cypress probably like more full sun than part sun. Evergreens in general like more sun and then shade. Um, the ones that do the best in shade are actually probably like Texas. Uh, and I see some boxwoods do okay. They just, they just stun it. But um, yeah, the cypress actually probably would do better. They're a little more of a touchy plant. They, they don't like those, to be honest with you, they probably don't like those damp sites. They like more of uh, a nice sunny place. So yeah, there's, there is some certain types of trees. Uh, from um, Hawking Hills, there I seen a bunch of them. The hemlocks or <coughs> hemlock? Yeah, yeah, those like uh, the moist conditions. But uh, yeah, most most shrubs they prefer most evergreens. They prefer a more of at least part partly sunny site. A little bit on the drier side. But yeah. The arboritas evergreens are they more needle? Dropping, or are they just more a evergreen bush? The arborvitaes, I mean, they don't really drop. You really can't tell where the, the needles drop in. It's not really that messy. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's what you're asking. What about, what about pests, like mosquitoes and that? Are they a good breeder of those? I don't have too many issues. I mean, mosquitoes can breed anywhere, but I don't think arborvitaes really cause problems. Japanese beetles, how can I get rid of them, or what do you recommend? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sure Denny can answer the question better I can, but there's a lot of insecticides. Uh, give your neighbor one of those bug a bag things. <laughs> They're far away. I don't think they have them. I have all of them. Yeah, I, um, I mean, spraying them with insecticide, or there's a lot of... Or go after the grubs. The grub, exactly. But if your neighbor don't go after the grubs, then that's going to be your problem too in the future. So it's a, it's one of those things. I feel like it's keep getting worse and worse. I mean, but they're, they're never really going to kill a tree or plant. I I never seen one really do that, but they're going to make them look bad. And so yeah, it's what are you telling people nowadays? <laughs> yeah, the beetle itself or the adult beetle, it's really hard to to control or get rid of uh, unless you can get them and smash them or put them in some soapy water or something like that um, to spray an insecticide um, it has to come in contact with the beetle and that makes it difficult especially if it's a, a big linden tree or something yeah. like that which is kind of their favorite um, but does that have any residue on the leaf or if it, if it uh, contacts with the beetle and the beetle falls off the new beetles come with the new beetles being exposed to that they, they have maybe a two or three day okay. residual. So yeah, that's why I knew you always had to keep spraying. Yeah, because um, so, it's it's really more has to be in contact with the right. with the beetle itself. So your your next best thing is uh, if you really have an issue, is to go after the grub in the in the lawn itself because uh, if you have a lot of them, you're probably going to have them in your lawn. Yeah. And this year we've had plenty of moisture which will help 
that egg to hatch, which is what they're laying right now. And so come end of August here, September. Well, you're going to see a lot of grub damage, aren't you? You're going to see grub damage, and usually at that time your lawn is in, under a little more stress also, and so it shows up probably. But put the bag as far away from what you're trying to protect as you can. <laughs> to because they, they, they work. They, 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 they attract the beetles. They eat in the way too. That's right. So it's just their smell. Yeah. One of the things you can do when they first start to come out, if you can get some of the early ones and get rid of them, so before they send out their pheromone to attract uh, others. That makes sense. You know, that, sometimes that'll cut down on the numbers. Yeah. Yep, and that's probably, you can do all you want on your property, but then the, the four right. properties around you don't do anything. It's not really, <laughs> you're losing battle. So. Do you have, are there certain trees or bushes that either attract or detract flies? <laughs> Not that I really know, to be honest with you. <laughs> okay. I just, I, I can't remember what it was, but I had a bush on one side of my house, and we had flies horribly anyways, yeah. but the flies just seemed to really... Well, there's some them. that have a fruit or something that, that might be attracted, that flies be attracted to. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, you're like, I, would, I would say that there were some, I can't really name anything right now, top of my head, but... I've seen like finally like buckthorns, they get the flower that attracted bees and other flies. But once the flower is done, they go away. So a lot of times it could be just short lived and you know, the bugs can go back away. But yeah, it's, I don't know anything that really repels flies though. <laughs> I'll buy it. Yeah, <laughs> I know, even the insect, even the mosquito repelling plants, they do great. But I've heard it, unless you're within a couple feet of it and you're rubbing up, get your skin, you're not doing much. So. Thank mm -hmm. you.